the travel log in history mm -hmm. the, the traveler who wrote who traveled traveled to different civilizations which are the travel logs and the travelers from the ancient indian period which are important to understand in that period well i would say uh, the the people that that wrote uh, the greeks some of them the hellenistic greeks not the greeks from the greek mainland uh, but the greeks that were settled in west asia uh, megasthenes is one who Unfortunately, we don't have his original text, but we have quotations from three different authors, uh, which more or less agree, though not completely. Um, very interesting narrative because, in a sense, he tries to bring what is happening in India in terms of rulership, state systems, social stratification, in uh, tune with what is happening in West Asia and Egypt and so on. There's a whole bunch of these people writing historical or narrative accounts of these different parts of uh, uh, the world from Egypt time. to West Asia to India. Uh, what, is, what has been most discussed in, uh, in the Me Megasthenes account is uh, the, the slight confusion that he creates over land tax and tax, was it rent or was it tax, which is a very fundamental difference, difference in terms of land ownership. Uh, then he talks about seven castes. Mm. So that raises the interesting question of what is he talking about when he's talking about castes, because seven is certainly no number that fits anywhere. One can understand four, one can understand five, one can understand an infinity, but yeah. seven <coughs> is, is awkward. Anyway, there have been lots of attempts to try and explain that. Then, very interestingly, I think, uh, and this has not been made much of, uh, he refers to the philosophers, by which he means the religious people, and he says that there are two trends of thought, the Brahman, the Brahmanes, as he calls them, and the Sarmanes, Brahmans and Shramans. Now, Shraman is the word that was used for Buddhists, Jains, Arjivaks, and so on, uh, in a sense, all those that were opposed to Vedic Brahmanism were generally dismissed and they were either called Nastik because they were not believers in the sacrality of the Vedas or they were called Shamans. And he uses this duality. And then if you look at the Indian texts, it goes on being referred to. Patanjali, writing the Sanskrit grammar around the turn of the Christian era, says, that uh, the Herma, the, when he's talking about dharma and religion and worship and so on, and he says there are these two groups, the Brahmins and the Shamans, and their relationship to each other is like the snake and the mongoose, uh, which is one of my favorite quotations. And, and it goes on. All right, that's his contribution. Then we have the Chinese Buddhist monks and travelers who come searching for the Western heaven, searching for Buddhist manuscripts and texts, of which uh, there's Fa Hien, who wrote a little travelogue, really, more than anything else. But the much more serious work of Hyun Xian, where he gives a, a, an itinerary of all his travels and describes in detail where there are still Buddhist uh, uh, places of worship, where there are Hindu temples and whether there are larger numbers of temples as compared to the Buddhist uh, viharas and so on. Uh, very, very detailed and extremely meticulously recorded. In fact, when Alexander Cunningham in the 19th century decided to do some archaeological work, he just picked up uh, Hyun Tsang. One of the things he did was that he, he picked up Hyun Tsang. And he kept reading his description and saying, oh, he says 90 li to the northeast. And so he went 90 li to the northeast. And a lot of his discovery of Buddhist sites actually worked. Were, were pretty closely uh, uh, aligned to, to what was said. I mean, they weren't precise, but it gave him a rough idea that this is the kind of area in which one will find looking, yeah. Buddhist yeah. sites. Anyway, so there, was, there were them. And then, of course, what concludes the 
what used to be called the ancient period, which I prefer to call early India, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, with, is the Alberuni's account, yeah. which is, of course, excellent in the sense that, you know, he, he, was an, he was a real intellectual who was deeply, deeply interested in this new culture and country that he came to. What fascinated him? I think the fact that it was so different. You know, he, he knew Central Asia, he knew Afghanistan. And according to some people, it was Mahmud who kind of exiled him and said, now you go to India. Oh. Uh, I don't know if this story is apocryphal, but anyway, it's a story that we, we were all told as students. But he comes here and he becomes extremely interested in the religion, in the worship, in the culture, and in the mathematics and the astronomy. And he's one of the people who writes very, very intelligently about what he sees and what his discussions have been. So learning about Al Baruni's writing would be very, very interesting for a student of history. Extremely he's interesting. He's written a wonderful passage about Banaras. Yes. A beautiful passage yes. about Banaras. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes.